Hey, everybody. Welcome to Trashy Divorces. I'm Alicia. I'm Stacy. Another week of trash candy. Thanks for joining us this week for a wrap and a start. We have some endings and some beginnings. Stacy, this week you're bringing us... So we're going to do some heiresses over on Patreon. So I thought I would start with the Patty Hearst story. She was abducted by left-wing radicals in 1974, and uh, then things got very weird. You have a conclusion. I do. So we are starting a new series on Patreon of March heiresses, which means we're closing out the current series, The Ladies Who Lunch the Swans. We've been through them all. But I would be remiss if I did not include this story. Lee Radswell being the famous bosom friend of Truman Capote and the sister of Jacqueline Kennedy. For you, Trash Pandas, before we moved on to heiresses in March. Before we get started Mm -hmm. and get off of our clouds today, (sighs) let's bring out the magic mirror with big love and thanks to our new Patreon folks who joined us over there. Thank you so much to Amanda P., Kate D., Jamie T., Taylor F., Denise M., Charlene C., Sarah R., and Marianne C., Christina K., Aaron L., Ak Oak, Angie, Sylvia M., Esther D., and Little Lulu Bird. Thank y'all so much for joining over there. We have some extra big thanks to give out to our newest super supporter, Lex. Thank you, all of our Patreon supporters. Thanks to y'all, Sunday audience, for coming back and listening. Is it time for us to do something now? Hey, you need to get off of my cloud. And let's go, go, go. So, Stacey, we're going to kick off heiresses on Patreon this week, going back a hundred years or so to a much longer passed away heiress. But you're kicking us off this week with a more recent one. More recent and for reasons that I will get into, probably the most famous American heiress of recent memory. And that includes, I mean, you know, we live in a world with Paris Hilton, so. True that. I am not covering Paris Hilton today. (laughs) Who's never been divorced? Talk about letting us down, Paris Hilton. God, Paris Hilton. Come on, Paris Hilton. Just take one for the team. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, actually, the person I'm covering today also never divorced. Uh, There are divorces in the story, though, so. Alicia. I'm ready for it. You had quite a bit to say about the venerable American capitalist William Randolph Hearst, 1863 to 1951, whose 30 plus year long romance with Marion Davies did unfortunately intrude on his marriage. It sure did. To his wife Millicent, with whom he had five sons. William Randolph Hearst was the Rupert Murdoch of his day and was able to live openly with his mistress and mingle in the highest society because he bought ink by the barrel and could make or break the careers of politicians and celebrities, depending on how the Hearst papers covered or did not cover you. All true. Nobody judges. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. This all stemmed from the fortune that his father, George Hearst, 1820 to 1891, had built up in mining after the gold rush brought adventurers of all types to the West. Um, George married 19-year-old Phoebe Apperson, in the early 1860s when he was 41. She was, again, 19. Wow. Although it was the 1860s, so I don't know, different times, whatever. William Randolph, WR, to his friends and enemies alike, uh, was (laughs) their only child. Skip ahead a generation to the offspring of those five boys that WR and Millicent had before Mary and Davies came along and wrecked it all. And you get to one of America's most famous heiresses, Patricia Hurst, Patty Hurst. It's a good story. Daughter of Randolph Hurst and Catherine Wood Campbell. Apparently, Patricia prefers to be called Patricia these days. But in the public imagination of the 1970s and beyond, Patty Hurst was whatever you wanted her to be. She was a victim of kidnapping, brainwashed to commit terrible crimes that left at least one person dead, or... She was a poor little rich girl who took a turn playing revolutionary with some way out there near to wells. Felon. No longer a felon. Pardoned person. Just, she's a lot of things. This isn't a standard divorce story. This is more of a rebel against your birthright story, followed by a prodigal child returning home story. (laughs) Welcome to heiresses. Welcome to heiresses. 
Patricia Hearst was born February 20th, 1954, Pisces, in San Francisco, so she was sort of perfectly situated for the blossoming counterculture that would make the Bay Area, for good and ill, its spiritual capital starting in the late 60s. She was the middle of five sisters. Oh, wow. In the middle of her mom's heart, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> um, and was raised, as most kids are, in a 22-room mansion in a suburb south of San Francisco. Good I mean, Lord. just a normal childhood in your 22-room mansion in your private schools. Okay. Uh, there were indications of a fierce independence in young Patricia early on. She refused to deb. She was oh, not. Really? She was not going to do that debutante circuit as a teenager, and uh, she bailed on the fancy Monterey boarding school where her parents had parked her because it was too restrictive. And I think, I think when I say bailed, I think that means that she accelerated her education and graduated a year early. Good for her. Mm -hmm. When she started at Berkeley in 1972, she did her freshman year at Menlo College and transferred in for her sophomore year. She upset her parents by moving in with her boyfriend. Oh, no. A grad student in his mid-20s named Stephen Weed. Great name, Stephen. Probably isn't the most upset her parents are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> or had been. Stephen had been a source of conflict in the family for some time because Patty had started dating him when she was 16 and he was her 23-year-old <sighs> math tutor employed at the school she was attending. Stephen Weed. But uh, apparently they had made their peace with him and... Then they really came around when Patty and Stephen became engaged. Oh, so, holy cats. Mm -hmm, Patty and her mother had been deeply involved in wedding plans for months. By the time three members of a quasi-cult led by a charismatic ex-con broke into their shared apartment on February 4th, 1974, and beat Stephen Weed about the head with a wine bottle oh my God. while grabbing Patty <sighs> Hurst and stuffing her into the trunk of their stolen car, gagged and blindfolded. Holy cats. Yeah. Just a truly terrifying... That's mm -hmm. terrible. So here is Time Magazine describing the haps in the Bay Area in a contemporaneous account um, a few months after Patty's kidnapping. Uh, and I don't have the author's name of this piece, It's but I'll have a link to it in our show notes. For San Francisco, normally one of America's most serene and sophisticated cities, there has been killing enough. Last January, the city heard from an apparent psychopath who called himself Zodiac. Ted Cruz. In letters... <laughs> <laughs> Obviously not. In letters to newspapers, he claimed to have murdered 37 people and threatened new violence. Police assigned him six slayings in Northern California dating back to 1968. This year, the city has had to contend with the zebra murders, in which 12 whites have been shot and killed by one or more black assailants. The latest occurred last week. The murders, together with the Hearst kidnapping, have created apprehension among many residents. It is not keeping most of them at home, but they are more cautious when they go out in public. Patty Hearst's captors were the Symbionese Liberation Army. SLA was a kind of violent, harebrained revolutionary group founded by a guy named Donald DeFreeze after he escaped from prison oh, shit. where he was serving time for robbing a sex worker. At the time, California was pretty interested in prison reform, so prisons would allow meetings between associations of prisoners and prison reform activists from, you know, outside, which had the unfortunate side effect of radicalizing some of the activists. Oh. And let's face it, in, you know, the Bay Area in the late 60s, early 70s, it's, it didn't take much to really radicalize. Really. Yeah, toss people. a rock without finding a radical. <laughs> <laughs> Hot bed. Okay. March 1973, DeFreeze, who was black, sort of casually walked away from a work detail and escaped Soledad State Prison that way. Oh. It was... Not good. Not, it was... Well, it was like... Not, it's just the 70s, man. I just... Well, I was in prison. I just walked I just off. walked while I, I had other things to I just, do. I didn't like it, really, so I left. Okay. So back in the real world, he reached out to some of these radicalized... Mostly white, like they came out of the student movement of the era. So like young people, he was young as well. So he reaches out to these activists like, hey, you know, I need a place to stay. Also, I would like to form the Symbionese Liberation Army. The name is derived from the word symbiosis. There, there, are, Yeah, there is no people on earth known as the Symbionese. So this group was never large. It was really just like a handful of people. So the um, army part is a misnomer? <laughs> 
it's the world's tiniest army. Oh, shit. <laughs> also, in terms of liberation, don't really know. You're what not liberating were. anyone? <laughs> the name is derived from the word symbiosis. And one can imagine that in California in 1973, DeFreeze plus the psychedelic drugs available to the era were really getting SLA members into some apparently deep places with the philosophy of symbiosis. Oh, my. And it was not at all weird sex. <laughs> we're just going to guess. Okay. It took little time for DeFreeze, now kookily referring to himself as General Field Marshal SinQ, oh, no. to establish SLA as a left-wing terrorist organization. Again, well, like you do. If a tiny one, here is Time Magazine again. The SLA struck into public consciousness last November, so this would be 1973, with a claim of responsibility for the murder of Oakland School Superintendent Marcus Foster, who was shot in a parking lot with cyanide-tipped bullets. He was killed instantly, so the cyanide was fully wasted. Foster's deputy, Robert Blackburn, was wounded in the attack. Foster had incurred the wrath of a community group by proposing student identity cards to help combat violence in the junior and senior high schools. Why the terrorist organization became involved was a mystery until it was discovered that one of its members, Willie Wolf, was also a member of the community group. They wanted to keep drug dealers off of campus. Makes sense. Right. Two months later, Oakland police arrested two white SLA members, Joseph Ramiro and Russell Little, 27 and 24, and charged them in Foster's murder. Ironically, it turns out, assassinating a preeminent black educator and the first African-American school superintendent in Oakland did not have the effect of endearing the SLA to other prominent black activist groups. Shocked. The Black Panthers washed their hands of this bullshit. Other new left groups were unpersuaded by the SLA's offers to blow stuff up on their behalf. <laughs> it was an insular little group, and it would have been funny or at least just like weirdly idiosyncratic if they had been harmless, but obviously... They're not harmless. They are not harmless. No. After the abduction of Patty Hearst, they stuffed her into a closet and engaged in psychological warfare against her for a couple of weeks, threatening to kill her, sexually assaulting her, and beginning to indoctrinate her with SLA propaganda tracts. Oh, no. Eventually, they started recording her making demands and setting conditions for her own release, as well as denouncing her family and her former life. She called her parents pigs. Like, it was... Do they have a ransom demand, or are they just being sadistic fuckers? Good Question. Okay. In theory, they had kidnapped her for leverage in getting those two guys who had been jailed for Marcus Foster's murder out of prison. Like she's a valuable piece of art or something? Well, that's the thing. When her father was like, dude, I publish newspapers and live off of family money. Like, I don't control California prisons. Like, what do you want me to what do? What do you want me to do about it? They changed their demand to, okay, well, you're going to give food to poor people. A lot of food to poor people. It was a weird, this thing went on for, the, this negotiation, such as it was, went on for a while. And sometimes it was like, every poor person in California. And sometimes it was like, it was like, one million dollars. You know, it was just this weird. So the SLA has no clear demands. They're just getting their rocks off torturing this child in the closet for a month. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. It's terrible. I saw it described as ideologically incoherent at one point. And again, like this... This process right. of, of making demands. At one point, they wanted Randy Hearst, whose personal fortune was like two million bucks, to give away four hundred million dollars worth of food. Oh, he <laughs> he was able to secure loans that allowed him to give away two point three million dollars worth of food to needy people in the Bay Area. I would like my daughter back now, please. And that did not happen. Mm. That did not happen. <sighs> Instead, on the 3rd of April, SLA released a recording where Patty announced that she had joined them and would now be called Tanya after oh. Che Guevara's main squeeze. Oh, this man. is so... Not funny. And yet, 12 days later, on April 15th, 1974, several SLA members committed a brazen armed robbery of the Hibernia Bank on Noriega Street in San Francisco. Patty Hearst may have refused to deb, but this was definitely a kind of coming out for her. Armed with a semi-automatic M1 carbine, mm -hmm. she barked orders at the customers and employees with what prosecutors would describe as panache. Oh, no. And at her later trial, present as evidence of her willing and even enthusiastic embrace of her membership in the SLA. Mm. 
On the bank's security footage, she's shouting, I'm Tanya! Up, up, up against the wall, motherfuckers! What every parent wants to see from their kidnapped child. Later in 1974, a propaganda image was released of Patty dressed up as a guerrilla fighter with some sort of, like, nasty short-bodied rifle with a very big scope posing like she's about to fire indiscriminately into a crowd. Pretty famous picture. Pretty famous picture standing in front of, like, the weird seven-headed cobra flag of SLA. It, it, does not, it looks like nothing. It looks like a doodle. Seven-headed cobra. But if you change out that flag, this is, I mean, we know this. It's a, it's a propaganda photo straight out of, like, ISIS propaganda. Some things never change. Back to the bank. Two people were shot during this bank robbery. Both survived, thankfully. The gang, now finding itself under significant pressure in San Francisco from the Popo and not expanding its membership because none of the other activist groups will talk to it, <laughs> relocated to Los Angeles. Oh, good. Everything's better in L.A. It wasn't. No. A month later, there was another episode that prosecutors used to show that Patty was a willing member of the gang and not a prisoner doing everything in her power to escape. This time, on May 16th, two of her SLA colleagues, they happen to be married, needed to do some shopping. So Patty's like, cool, I'll drive. She drives. She waits across the street from Mel's Sporting Goods in the van by herself. Doesn't drive away. While, yep, mm -hmm. while her kidnappers are inside shopping. Patty's got the brain worms. That, yeah, that's how it... That's how it seems. Okay. Um, I mean, that's if you've got the opportunity to GTFO and you do not GTFO. Right. Something psychological is happening. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. Strong agree. Yeah. And it's pretty clear that like her, her friends fully expected that. Her when, to be there. Yeah. When they walked out of the store, like she's going to be across the street in the van where we left her. So that is one data point. Except that things got really screwy really fast because the manager of the store noticed the the guy, SLA member in the store, pocket some small item. Uh -oh. So like as the couple left, the manager and an employee ran out to confront them. There was a physical altercation. The SLA guy drew a pistol oh, that was God. knocked to the ground. And across the way, Patty Hearst hops out of the van and unloads her rifle into the storefront. Like the marquee above them? No. So thankfully, no one was hit. She aimed high. That was good. They abandoned, like, they just fled on foot. The, the van was abandoned. And eventually they hijacked two other cars and abducted their owners, like, to get away. Meanwhile, police found an old parking ticket in the van, which led the police to the SLA safe house. SLA... Funny had been watching the Mel Sporting Good things play out on TV like that. <laughs> like, it's modern terrorism, I guess. So they fled the safe house, this thinking is a like we're comedy kind of. kinda. We're in hot water here. Shit. And then within a day, like police got a tip off from the whoever's house they were hiding at. Their their parent called the police and was like, "There are armed people in my kid's home." right now go there so at this point these are the people who abducted patty hearst these are bank robbers these are like they killed marcus foster 400 officers from lapd fbi la county sheriff california highway patrol and just for fun the la fire department oh my god descend on this neighborhood they just start launching tear gas into the safe house which was met with bursts of automatic weapons fire because they'd all altered their semi-automatic weapons. Two hours in, the house catches fire. Oh my god. This did not stop the battle. In the end, six SLA members were dead from causes ranging from smoke inhalation to gunshot wounds. And Donald DeFries is believed to have taken his own life as his side lost the siege. Initially, and no doubt horrifyingly for the Hearst family, it was believed that Patty was among the dead. But no. She and her fellow, like, Mel Sporting Goods escapees were sitting in a hotel room in Anaheim watching all of this happen on television. Oh, my God! It is a nightmare. This... Look, okay, she's kidnapped the 4th of February, 1974. Up what to day then, is this? This is May the 17th of 1974. This so is, inside like... inside of three months, three months, I've become a 
fully inducted terrorist mm-hmm. member. Yup. Yup. Just watched like a bunch of her comrades, her abductors, and then now her comrades get like burned and shot to death by the police. Like, woo. Yeah, this does not end Patty Hearst's revolutionary phase. The remaining members, including her, moved back to the Bay Area where they had more contacts and, you know, more of like the student movement that they could couch surf with. Help them hide. And for the next 16 months, Patty Hearst was doing all kinds of crimes with them. They were making improvised explosive devices to try to kill cops. This failed, which is probably why Patty Hearst is not in prison today. And she drove the getaway car from another bank robbery. And in this one, a bank customer named Myrna Opsal was killed by gunshot wound. So this would be the second SLA murder victim after Marcus Foster. So when Patty Hearst was finally nabbed by San Francisco police and the FBI on September 18th, 1975, she was in a world of legal trouble. Oh, yeah, she was. Yeah, she was. But also... In a pretty bad physical and psychological state, she weighed 87 pounds. That's terrible. At the time of her capture, her IQ tested significantly lower than it had pre-SLA. She suffered from nightmares, and her memory of life before SLA was very jumbled. There were Mm -hmm. large gaps. It was, I mean, it was a trauma experience. (laughs) Yeah, for Mm -hmm. sure. Her family, still quite rich, uh, hired F. Lee Bailey who was at that point the most famous defense attorney in the country, to handle the bank robbery charges that she would be tried for beginning on January 15th, 1976. These were federal charges. She would later be charged at the state level for the Mel's Sporting Good. Boom, boom, boom. Aim high incident. I mean, it's amazing to me that like California in the 1970s, apparently just people were routinely opening fire in public. (laughs) I guess it's still true today everywhere in America. Anyway... So the trial was set to begin January 15th, 1976, and F. Lee Bailey would, of course, later be part of the O.J. Simpson defense team. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he had represented the brain surgeon, Sam Shepard. Correct. No, he made his reputation on that and then- He he did. Loses much of his reputation here. It it From what I remember, I don't know, you tell me. The trial went poorly from the start- with the judge seemingly predisposed to evidence and findings that were adverse (laughs) to Patty Hearst's case, and finding that evidence that might help her wasn't especially germane to the proceedings. Bailey, in what is remembered as an epic mistake, had Patty take the stand in her own defense, which was a complete disaster. She did so poorly and came across so badly to the jury that there was speculation that her jailers had drugged her. Really? The nail in the coffin came toward the end of the trial when another surviving SLA alum, Emily Harris, she was the wife at Mel's Sporting Goods, gave a jailhouse interview in which she revealed that contrary to the story Patty told about having been sexually assaulted by William Wolfe, he of he was in the neighborhood group that didn't like Marcus Foster, right. yeah, and who had died at the safe house siege, that instead of, you know, that being an assault, that... He was, was basically, he was, he was her SLA boyfriend. Ooh. Um, and to prove it, she was like, yeah, Patty carries this trinket that Willie gave her. Like she had it always, even after he died, she carried it. It was like the thing. So the prosecutors go to the evidence locker where Patty Hearst's purse is sitting there and they go through the purse and sure enough, there's there, the trinket. There oh is the trinket that Harris had described. And then... They go look at photos of the bodies they pulled out of that house. And sure enough, there is Willie Wolf wearing the identical piece as a necklace when he died. Okay. Patty Hearst was convicted and sentenced initially to 35 years, but that was like pending sentence reduction, blah, blah. Um, The original judge died. And so like a second judge comes in and is like, you get seven years, which is much more, I mean, federal sentencing. I don't know how it was in the 70s, but federal sentencing guidelines, you pretty much never get the max. She was out on bail during much of the ensuing years for an appeals process. And this required like her, her father invested so much money in bodyguards. I found his obit, like people were like, he was never the same after that abduction. Oh, I can't imagine that you would be. No. President Jimmy Carter famously commuted Patty's sentence And she was released on February 1st, 1979. And then Bill Clinton cleared the slate entirely with a pardon for her on his last day in office 
Ah. 2001. It was a big day for pardons that day. I I remember. (laughs) Mark Rich. Many have pointed to to both of these as proof that the powerful have a tier of justice all to themselves. And like, yeah, what clued you in? (laughs) Golly. I'm shocked. Was this the one that (laughs) made that clear? (laughs) (laughs) Woo. Whatever mix of threats, thrills, rebellion, and terror turned young Patricia Hearst into a 1970s armed revolutionary was all the way gone by the time she walked out of prison in February 1979, just about five years since the ordeal began with her abduction. Stephen Weed no longer figured in her life, and two months into her new freedom, she married Bernard Lee Shaw, a policeman who had moonlighted as her bodyguard while she was out on bail for the appeal. Okay. This marriage seems like it was an exceptionally happy one. They remained together until Bernard's death in 2013. Oh, wow. They had two daughters, more Great. American heiresses. And they involved themselves in a variety of philanthropic endeavors. Well done, Patricia. Yeah, she's been in a bunch of John Waters movies, and she's had a very interesting go of things in her life. There is an actual divorce that has stemmed from all of this, and that is Patricia's parents, Randolph and Catherine. They who were called upon to give $400 million of food aid to Californians and then watched their daughter brandish an assault rifle in a bank robbery came apart under the enormous strain of this period. And they, oh, wow. they, yeah, they divorced in 1982. California in the 70s, man. I'm given this period of Patricia Hurst's life 2.3 million trash cans for the actual value of the food her father distributed to needy people. But all of them are wearing berets and green fatigues and ready to fight against the injustice of littering. <laughs> wow. And that's Patty Hurst. That is Patty Hearst. Still kicking it. Yeah. Yeah. Doing good things. Showing dogs. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Good good for she's her. a champion dog show her. Totally approve of that yeah. hobby. Really on board with that. Yeah, I guess in the world of hobbies that Patricia Hearst could have, we'll take that. Dog showing, A+. plus. Trot, trot. Sounds good. On it. Let's take a quick break. And we're coming back with, whoo, more trash. <laughs> trashy. We'll just call it that. Trashy, trashy. Like after we, we hear from our sponsors. We could all use a little support in life, and your bra should be an easy place to find it. It is so easy when you use Third Love. Third Love uses measurements from millions of women to design their bras with all day comfort and support. Third Love has more than 80 sizes from cups double A to I, including half cup sizes and bands from 30 to 48. Third Love is able to achieve this magic with the fitting room quiz. It is a fun and interactive experience that will focus on you, your size, breast shape, current fit issues, and your own personal style to find the perfect bra that's just right for you. Fit stylists are available as well for one-on-one chats to ensure you get the greatest fit and support available without leaving the comfort of your own home. There are no awkward dressing rooms. There is no hassle. 18 million women already know this. They've used this service to find their perfect fit And Third Love really does stand behind this promise. If you do not love it, returns and exchanges are free. Even better, Third Love donates these returned bras to women in need, supporting charities in their local San Francisco Bay Area and across the United States. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they are offering our Trashy Divorces listeners 20% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash trashy now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 20% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash trashy for 20% off today. Friends, there's never a wrong time to take a look at the things that are keeping you from living your best life. And if now is your moment, we recommend BetterHelp. BetterHelp is confidential, convenient, and safe professional counseling with your own licensed therapist. BetterHelp's quick questionnaire matches you with a counselor in under 24 hours. And you can message your counselor at any time, even between scheduled phone or video sessions. Not clicking with your counselor? That's fine. It's free to change. BetterHelp is available worldwide. And while it is more affordable than traditional counseling, there's also financial aid. It's just never been easier to find a licensed professional counselor who specializes in the subject matter you want to focus on. In fact, so many people are using BetterHelp these days that they're recruiting counselors in all 50 U.S. states. We want you to start living your happiest life today. As a Trashy Divorces listener, you get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com trashy. Join more than 1 million people who are taking charge of their mental health. 
Visit BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash trashy. Believe it or not, this is 2021, and the second verse does not have to be the same as the first. If you would like to get some help changing your tune, the ladies of the Oak Tree Group are ready and willing to help you. They believe in empowerment through knowledge. The Oak Tree Group is offering each of our listeners a free one-hour consultation on your financial concerns. It is your money, so there are no bad questions. Start the year off right and get your finances singing. Contact the women of the Oak Tree Group for assistance. Yep. That is right. All of the holistic planners at the Oak Tree Group are female. Check out their website, www.theoaktreegroup.net, for contact details and more information on their services. Don't worry. The musical references in this ad are just for fun and not a requirement of the services offered. Again, their website is www.theoaktreegroup.net. So, Alicia, I understand you have the sister of... Just hands down, one of the most famous women ever to emerge from the United States. Is that correct? I do. This week for you, my Mm -hmm. darling trash pandas. Mm -hmm. I have a story. I have the story. Wowza. We talked many seasons ago about Princess Margaret and her trashy divorces, along with the very complicated relationship Margaret had with her sister, Queen Elizabeth II. If there is an American version of this queen and princess thing, this is it, hands down. Today, we're going to talk about Leah Radzowell, baby sister to Jacqueline. Bouvier Kennedy Onassis? Is that the right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) I like Uh, how sometimes you leave off the really important details. Jacqueline, I say Jacqueline. Everyone knows who Jacqueline is. Jackie O. Yeah. Okay. And a life full of competition of rivalry, of a mago. We talked last week on our Tuesday series about the 1975 Truman Capote chapter published in Esquire called The Coat Basque 1965. The meanest, bitchiest (laughs) words that have ever been written in American fiction. Truman sells out all of his swans, every last one of them, trashes them in print, which is not even thinly disguised. And Stacey, you reacted a bit. In this story, when I told you how Truman Capote described Lee and Jackie in the scene, the line is, a pair of Western geisha girls. The look on your face was like, wow, Alicia, that's kind of harsh. Yeah, I didn't like it. Yeah, I I mean, even for Truman, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of harsh, but I'm going to let you decide after you hear the story at maybe about how much Truman knew and wanted to reveal through the lines of that chapter. Lee Radzowell, all told, three husbands, three divorces, countless lovers, and a never-ending ongoing feud of love-hate something with her sister her whole life. It is competitive, it is complicated, and they really, really do each other dirty. Let's dive into the trashy. Caroline Lee Bouvier was born in Manhattan, March 3rd, 1933. She's the second daughter of John Verno Bouvier the third, and Janet Norton Lee, nay Bouvier. Their first daughter, Jacqueline, was born in 1929. Seems like it should be a happy family, but alas, it is not. Janet and Blackjack, as John mm-hmm. Vernon Bouvier the third is known, Janet and Blackjack marry in 1928 when Janet is 22 and Blackjack is 37. A little bit about the parents here, friends, because I'm not good. Daddy Blackjack is a Wall Street broker. He says he can trace his lineage to French soldiers that fought in the Revolutionary War. Quite a reputation. Blackjack also looks a lot like Clark Gable. He's black-haired and dashing. He's also an early proponent of the sun lamp. Blackjack likes to be tan. In addition to the name of Blackjack, he is also called Jack the Sheik because of his penchant for the tanning lamp. Yeah, I think in the history of trashy divorces, we have found that very vain men do not come out looking good. (laughs) Well, Blackjack, think like swashbuckling pirate. Wide lapel suits, paisley ties. His ride is a black mercury convertible. He's a regular at the 21 Club. 
He goes uh, to watch boxing in Madison Square. He has cocktails at the Racket Club. Like, on paper, Blackjack sounds perfect. All the right credentials. Also, a big fat liar. Blackjack will tell Janet that his family is loaded, which is not entirely true. There's no hidden fabulous wealth in the Bouvier family, or at least not the kind that Janet is expecting upon her marriage. Mama Janet, Norton Lee, before she marries Blackjack, I presume was sweet and nice and all things good. She will not stay that way after her marriage to the cad and scoundrel Bouvier. You're going to hear a lot about Janet in this story and how her character develops as the years go on. The experiences we go through form us, and I don't know if they formed Janet for the better or not. She passed a lot of crap to her girls. Once Janet and Blackjack marry, Janet becomes aware of two things. First, there's no family money in the BVA family. And once the Depression hits, the modest fortune that the family had is kind of wiped. Also, and more problematically, Blackjack is a drunk and a violent one at that. He will physically abuse Janet, who truly does not take his shit. She's known to throw plates and curses back at him. To put it mildly, it is a volatile marriage. Janet and Blackjack have Jackie in 1929, Lee in 1933, and the childhood that these two girls have is not ideal. To add insult to injury, Blackjack is also a notorious philanderer. Doesn't even try to hide it. He is famously photographed holding his mistress's hand while posing in, his, in a picture with his wife on the other side of him holding the hand with his mistress. <clears throat> cool guy. <clears throat> this is printed on the front pages everywhere. Janet is humiliated. She's finally had enough. Janet and Blackjack will separate in 1936. They will finally divorce in 1940. Did she have a hard time proving infidelity? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not in this case. Okay. Four years will separate the sisters. And all of these events with the parents are happening early in their childhood development, right? Jackie is always Black Jack's favorite. Always and forever. Middle of his heart. Lee is always from day one in Jackie's shadow. Janet's not nice to Lee either. I do love this. The person Lee most admires growing up in, as a kid, is Lana Turner. Lee says she's seen the epitome of glamour and her glitzy surroundings so enviable, the opposite of my mother's extremely banal taste. <laughs> <laughs> Janet, for her part, will marry up in 1940 to Hugh D. Auchincloss Jr., who is the heir to the Standard Oil fortune. Janet makes a trade-off here. She's not going to make the same mistake twice. Life gets a whole lot more comfortable for Janet and the girls being married to the heir of the Standard Oil fortune. You would think. What Janet does not have in this relationship is sex or physical intimacy. She's running homes. They have a lot of homes, but she kind of makes that compromise to be well provided for and cared for. Hugh Auchincloss is known as Uncle Hughty. Jackie and Lee call him that. Uncle Hughty has children by previous marriages one of those being Gore Vidal. Janet and Uncle Hughty will have two children in their marriage as well. Okay, so let me go back. Because when I talk about Janet being mean, she calls Lee fat all the time. The cows on the farm in Virginia that Lee sees out her window, because Lee's window in the home looks out over the cow fields, where Jackie's window in the home looks out over the bay and the boats in the water. But the cows in the field that Lee gets to look out of her window are named Jacqueline and Caroline, which <clears throat> is Lee's first name. Isn't that terrible? Mama Janet is her own Imago tornado. Yeah, that's real weird there. Uh. Let me name a cow after you and let you look at it all the time. And Lee, nev like... Lee's tiny. Lee stays tiny like a bird her entire life. And you have to wonder how that affected her. Anyway, lots going on in the 1940s. It's society and all. 
So the Auchincloss's have lots of estates. There's one on Long Island, the farm in Virginia, there's a Rhode Island property. Lee will attend the Potomac School in Washington. She will go to Miss Porter's School in Farmington, Connecticut. But Lee's grades are average. Lee hates participating in sports. Doesn't give a hoot about the rah-rah, sis-boom-ba thing that is so competitive in Miss Porter's. It's hard to go to the same institutions where your older sibling went and was the star, all capital letters with glitter falling down all over it. Like, Jackie's always the star. She's more studious. She's more athletic. She's a competitive equestrian. To take a turn of a phrase from Jan Brady, Jackie, Jackie, (laughs) Jackie. Jackie's not only favored by Blackjack, but Jackie's also favored by every school, every teacher, mom, everyone. Like, poor Lee gets screwed over all the time in the shadow of her sister. Lee will attend Sarah Lawrence College for a year or so and eventually land in 1950, working as an assistant at Harper's Bazaar to the legendary editor Diana Vreeland. Right, and that's a Hearst property, at least at the time it was. Spider. The summer of 1951 will bring a trip with Jackie and Lee. They take it all over Europe, Paris, Rome, Florence, Venice, Madrid. Mama Janet has coordinated this trip. So Jackie will not accept the Prix de Paris gig that she was offered by winning the contest at Vogue. We talked about this on Patreon forever Mm -hmm, ago. mm -hmm. Janet engineers the whole thing, says you cannot take this. Instead, you're spending the summer babysitting your sister on her grand tour of Europe now that she's graduated high school. Jackie and Lee do manage to make it a lot of fun and will use Lee's words and Jackie's drawings to publish a book in 1974 called One Special Summer. It is a fantastic little marvel of a piece if you can get your hands on it. I have a copy. I'll see if I can get some photos from that posted as well. It's charming. One special summer. Anyway. Okay. Early 1950s. The girls have a purpose in the world. And it's not all these frivolous things. It is in the land of Mama Janet getting married to people with cash. To rich people, yeah. Or cachet. Jackie's a complete failure. She's 24 and not married. And here, for the first time, at least Lee can do something right. First marriage. April 18th, 1953, on a rainy day with a very mad sister stuffed into a yellow bridesmaid's dress. Jackie's angry. Jackie should be getting married first. And now Lee has outdone her with an illegitimate prince, no less. Lee is marrying Michael Temple Canfield, the publishing executive and also the adopted son of Cass Canfield. What do you mean, illegitimate prince? If you believe the rumors, Michael Canfield is the illegitimate son of Prince George, Duke of Kent, and Kiki Preston. Prince George is the uncle to Queen Elizabeth II. He's the brother of her father and Eddie VIII. He dies in 1942 at the beginning of World War II in a pretty shady way. We talked about him on Patreon not too long ago. He's not the point of the story, but Prince George, all trashy. A lot of Prince George's over (laughs) across the pond. At the time of her wedding, Lee is 20 and thinking all of her dreams are coming true. They get married. She and her prince leave for London where they will begin their new life of wedded bliss. Jackie's 24 and she's mad. She will get her prince though. And I mean that term loosely, maybe by prince five months later when Jackie will marry John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Of her first husband, Lee will tell T Magazine, quote, I was very young when we met and he was so good looking and clever. I wanted so badly to get away from my mother and he seemed to offer everything. Looks, privilege, friends, fun. His father was chairman of Harper and Brothers, so he led a very literary life and was a brilliant editor. I was deliriously happy for a while, moving to London, our house in Chester Square, but... He drank seriously. He was very fragile. One day I couldn't open the door. He was slumped out, cold, inside. He tried to stop, but nothing worked for any time. He said I was so in tune with life, and he wasn't any longer. 
It's a lovely sentiment, really and truly, but taking that statement alone, Lee, right, not fulfilled in the marriage clearly. So Lee will fulfill herself with an affair with a married man, Prince Stanislaw Radziwill. He is the scion of a Polish aristocratic family who settled in London after escaping the Nazi invasion in Poland. His last name seems significant. Gore Vidal, maybe the worst stepbrother ever when it comes to telling your secrets, will write that Prince Stas, that's how he's known, Prince Stas, builds his small fortune in real estate with funds that were stolen from the Polish Red Cross during the war. Prince Stas, by the end of the 1950s, is on a second marriage, and that isn't really going well, so a married Prince Stas and a married Lee carrying on. Gore Vidalio. He also lets us something else a little bit here go. Lee is not only having a passionate affair with Prince Stas. I mean, to your point, important name. He's going to be hubby number two by 1959. But Gore Vidal also writes in his memoir that Lee has bragged to him personally about sleeping around with somebody else too. You want to guess who that might be? You'd never know him to be a notorious philanderer. Her brother-in-law, Jack Kennedy. Wow. Lee's husband, Michael Canfield, confirms this rumor to Gore as well. Whoa. Now, the thing with Lee and Jack is never a love affair, never full-blown. But these trysts will take place all through the marriage of Jack and Jackie, you know, when they get a little bored and need something to do when charades tires out, I guess. So the marriage of Lee and Prince Stas has been described as one of the most cynical and faithless marital unions that has ever happened. He is not famously rich. She is not richly famous. But these two will use each other in a game of high stakes power plays that they both will lose when it all comes crashing down. Lee, again, will idealize this marriage in later interviews, saying, Being married to Stas was certainly the happiest part of my life. So he must have been the love of my life. There were other infatuations, other loves even. But I never knew the joy or knowledge of life and living that I experienced with Stas. I don't know how much faith you want to put in that. Okay. Investigative journalist Peter Evans will write that Stas so blatantly exploits the sexual charms of his wife that many will accuse him of being a pimp. Well, this podcast is so revealing. 1959, March 19th. Lee is going to marry Prince Stas. Oh, he's 20 years her senior. That's fine. There are pleas to the Vatican for an annulment of the marriage to Michael Canfield. Lee and Stas get married. They move into a home on Buckingham Place, which is right next door to the palace that you may be familiar with already. That would be Lindsay Buckingham Palace. <laughs> uh, Lee and Stas have two kids. The first pretty immediately. Lee's pregnant when they get married. But they also both immediately pretty much start having affairs. Prince Stas is carrying on with Da, da, da. Automobile heiress Charlotte Ford. No. Yes, ma'am. Who ends up, ends up or previously had. This is year. Like, hold on. Oh, wait. So she's like 19 or something. Yes. Yikes. Who, yeah, ends up marrying Stavros gonna, yeah. Nearchus uh-huh. briefly a few years later. Prince Stas is looking for more cash because Lee doesn't have it. And Lee's shopping habits are extensive. So Prince Stas is looking at heiress Charlotte Ford Mm -hmm. like, hey, maybe I can dump this one and marry up. Charlotte, as we talked about last week, right, is eventually going to leave Prince Stas in the mid-60s to marry Stavros Nearchos, the Greek shipping magnate that we covered last week. Yeah, Trashy spiderwebs everywhere. Okay, Lee is still carrying on with President Kennedy at this time. Even in the early 60s, she even goes with him on a trip to Berlin when Jackie's pregnant and cannot travel. So keep in mind, Jack and Jackie's first daughter, Caroline, is named after Lee, who is Caroline Lee, right? How much do we suspect Jackie knew 
that they were hooking up. Do we think she knew? It's tricky. There's legit like a forensic DNA force that's working in the White House that goes in and cleans beds. Right. To like, you can't have a blonde hair. That's the thing. He had a thing for blondes and Jacqueline Kennedy, famously brunette. Now, there are rumors on the other hand that Jackie does have dalliances herself, but Jackie... To her credit, follows my golden rule in life, which is if you can't be good, at least be discreet. So nothing on Jackie's side is reported. I mean, Jack's wasn't reported at the time either, but whatever she did, she kept much more undercover than her philandering husband. Okay. Okay. So Jackie (laughs) will once tell her stepbrother, Gore Vidal, that what she wanted most in life was to be desired by men. But see, Lee, Lee's prettier. She's more sexually alluring than Jackie. Sure, Jackie may have had the brains and the smarts and the horses and the husband and all, but Lee? I don't know. Think about Truman and a pair of Western geisha girls, okay? Because see, Prince Stas is not the only one fooling around in the marriage. What's good for the goose, good for the gander. So during the Prince Stas and Charlotte Ford affair, who better for Lee to start an affair with than Aristotle Onassis? Okay. Long-term affair with Maria Callas happening. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Aristotle, good guy that he is, will reward Prince Stas for the favor of sleeping with his wife by giving Prince Stas a very lucrative seat on the board of his airline that Onassis owns. This is not the first nor the last of the lucrative directorships that Prince Stas will receive for pimping out his wife. It's just different if you're rich, apparently. Oh, I forgot to mention. JFK will attempt to appoint Prince Stas as the ambassador to Poland for the U.S. as well. But that plan does not come to fruition because of all of those allegations of Prince Stas stealing all the money from the Polish Red Cross come bubbling up and the whole ambassador plan is nixed, but not that it wasn't underway. So the early 1960s will have the Kennedys and the Radzewells socially together. Holidays, family gatherings, attending state functions, visits to the White House and all that, meetings with the Queen and Grace Kelly. Jackie and Lee will take another sister vacation together in 1962 for a month They're going to relive all of that one special summer magic. This time they go to Italy, India, and Pakistan. In August 1963, Jackie will deliver a son, Patrick, who will die two days after his birth. It's terribly sad. Lee, who is on the Christina with her lover, Aristotle, and Aristotle's lover, Maria Callas, takes off to help her sister. Aristotle will say, bring Jackie here to recover, which Lee will do. Jackie and Lee will spend a month on the Christina, Jackie recovering, restoring herself after the devastating blow, the loss of a child. No one in D.C. is happy that Jackie's going on this trip. Jack, her friends, like, you cannot do this. It's a bad look. Jackie, you can't go. Jackie goes anyway. Sure. Trip to Cancun. Sometimes (laughs) you have to. Jackie has another motive, which she knows Lee wants to divorce Prince Stas and marry Aristotle. And Jackie's like, no, you can't do this, Lee. How would it look for the administration? When the sisters leave the yacht, Aristotle will buy them both gifts. Aristotle gives Jackie a diamond and ruby necklace. Aerie will give Lee three diamond studded bracelets. Lee will write to her on again, off again, lover and brother-in-law Jack, that she feels Jackie's rubies outshone her, quote, dinky little bracelets that Caroline wouldn't wear to her own birthday party. Diana Dubois will write in her 1995 book called In Her Sister's Shadow, an intimate biography of Lee Radswell, quote, the story of Jackie's effect on Airy during that cruise has been told many times. Lee would tell her intimates later that she was only trying to do something nice for her sister when she brought her along on the Christina and that Jackie co-opted Onassis on that cruise. Echoing the news accounts of the era, the book will add, 
Jackie's expropriation of Onassis drove a deep wedge between the two women, which, when coupled with a parallel development between Jackie and Robert Kennedy in the aftermath of the assassination, was the beginning of a profound change in their relationship, one that will last. Moving along to that tragic day, November 22nd, 1963, JFK is assassinated and Lee dutifully comes to D.C. to help her sister, providing emotional support during the crisis. She's always with Jackie, like every step of the way that the public sees Lee is by Jackie's side. Behind closed doors, Jackie is hateful to Lee. Lee will later confide to Cecil Beaton that she goes through hell trying to help her sister. She says she's really more than half around the bend. She can't sleep at night. She can't stop thinking about herself and never feeling anything but sorry for herself. But Lee's there, getting slapped by Jackie at one point, helping pack up her boxes to move out of the White House, spiderweb here, into the Georgetown home of Avril Harriman, which has been offered to Jackie and her children as a place to land when they leave the White House. Lee will also help settle Jackie in New York City as well. But the death of the president sort of frees Lee up in a way. She feels there are a lot of things she couldn't do with her brother-in-law as president. And now those chains are off. Lee's making new friends, reaching out of the circle she knows and into new ones. And a friend that she will make along the way is Truman Capote. Truman Capote will say about Lee, Ah, the princess. Well, she's easily described. She's a beauty inside, outside. He calls her princess dear. Let's do a quick catch up because Lee's always busy. Back in 1958, she will coordinate the American fashion exhibit at the 1958 World's Fair. By the early 1960s, she is a writer for McCall's magazine. By 1967, Lee has decided that acting is going to be her thing and she'll study at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts and the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. Her BFF Truman is like you must play Tracy Lord in The Philadelphia Story, which is a role that Katherine Hepburn makes famous. There's going to be a revival held in Chicago. Lee's reviews are terrible. It finishes after a four-week run. So she loves it, but maybe she's not... Great at it. Truman, king of bad advice, is like, okay, great. That totally bombed. Now you should do a movie. Talks David Susskind into casting Lee in the role of Laura, originally made famous in 1944 by Gene Tierney. Good Lord. Which premieres in January of 1968 on ABC. And again, reviews, not kind. <laughs> Lee will hang up the acting idea is it possible, at this time. Is it possible that Truman just liked to see her fail? I wouldn't put that past Truman Capote. Now, Lee has been busy acting and all, right? And Charlotte Ford has left Prince Stas and married Stavros. And Charlotte Ford has divorced him maybe by they, now. Yeah, or they two. were together for a year or something. Yeah, nobody's paying much attention to Jackie and Aristotle. Some people say their liaison started on that 1963 recovery trip. But after the events of 1968, with so much tragedy in the United States after the assassination of MLK and riots in Vietnam and multiple threats on her children's lives, and after the assassination of her brother-in-law, Robert Kennedy, and... After negotiating a pretty great financial deal, Jackie and Aristotle Onassis are going to shock the world in October 1968 by announcing their upcoming marriage. Jackie does not call her sister Lee. Aristotle calls her sister Lee to share the happy news and insists that Lee attend the private ceremony that's going to happen on his private island Scorpios just two days later. How'd that go? Yeah, Lee's pissed. She's blindsided by what she thinks is her sister's betrayal. Lee will confide to Truman Capote how outraged she is, like, this is a last straw, I'm totally done. This statement that Lee will give to the press sounds good enough, unless you get the undertone, which is... Here we go. Quote, I'm very happy to have been at the origin of this marriage, which will, I am certain, 
bring my sister the happiness she deserves. <clears throat> little shade, little sisterly shade. So Lee, still married to Prince Stas, will end up beginning again. This time with Jackie's good friend, a dude named Peter Beard, who is a handsome photographer, diarist adventurer. Peter Beard's also a really close friend of her husband's, Prince Stas, but that doesn't stop the affair Lee has with him, which will effectively end her relationship with husband number two. Peter Beard will move in with Lee into her Manhattan apartment. Lee will rent a home in Montauk during this time in a compound designed by Stanford White. The compound belongs to Andy Warhol and film director Paul Morrissey. Peter Beard will introduce Lee to the Warhol circle. Okay. Now, Jackie likes Peter Beard. Peter Beard tutors her kids in art history. So the sisters, even though they're not on good terms, will continue to haunt each other's lives. Filmmaker Jonas Mika says they're like two trees whose branches keep getting tangled up, their shadows indistinguishable. But it's the swing in 70s, yo. Lee is on the cover of Andy Warhol's Interview magazine. <laughs> Lee will host Mick Jagger in a pretty legendary party in Montauk. Peter Beard and Lee are going to go on the road with the Rolling Stones in 1972 on their North American tour. Truman Capote has been hired by Rolling Stone magazine to write about the tour with Peter Beard supplying photos. That doesn't really pan out. There's some shit that happens with the fallout for that. But 1972, big year for Lee because she's also looking to make a documentary about her childhood in the Hamptons using her aunt, Edith Beale, as the narrator. Edith is Blackjack's sister. So Peter Beard, Lee's lover, is like, hey, you need to meet these brothers that would be the perfect filmmakers for this project, David and Albert Mazels. Off she goes to talk to Aunt Edie, and whoa, Lee gets to Grey Gardens and uh, discovers when she arrives, squalor. The 28-room mansion that is, you know, so many memories of her happy childhood, the mansion's decaying, it's dilapidated. There's 60 cats just roaming through the house, and the home is under threat of being condemned, and the Mazels are like, this is filmmaking gold, and take over the project, which will give us the 1975 documentary, Great, Great Gardens. Gardens. Focusing instead on the narrative of Big Edie and Little Edie, not the nostalgic remembrances of growing up in a happy childhood with Lee. The happiest part she had, anyway. Okay, so there's a mission to clean up the home that Jackie will get credit for. But there's all this footage of the Maisels shooting Lee at home with Big Edie and Little Edie cleaning up the house, moving the refrigerator, cleaning the floorboards. Like, Big Edie and Little Edie lovely. Lee is the mover and shaker of this project, and Jackie gets the credit. Again, Jackie, Jackie, Jackie. Okay, during this time, 1974, Prince Stas and Lee are finally, mercifully, divorced. And he kind of becomes a pitiful man by the end of it. He's going to die two years later in 1976. 1975, we have the falling out with Truman Capote over Lakote Basque, 1965. In 1976, Lee will launch her own interior design business. Now, Lee has been decorating since she was like 17. She loves it. Like not only decorating herself, but interiors as well. She's, she's really good at it. She should have done landscape design and called it Great Gardens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hell, I forgot to mention. In the early 70s, Lee is also going to make a pilot for a talk show for CBS called Conversations with Lee Radziwill. But it doesn't ever really take off in the Watergate era. I think the public attention was... Yeah, no one wants a... Pretty captive at the Talk show, oddly the enough. They have hearings to watch. <laughs> There's also a memoir that Lee is under contract for in the 1970s as well as the 90s, but writing, like, not least thing. She will realize a volume in 2001 called Happy Times. 
which is a remembrance similar to that 1974's One Special Summer of the sisters' happier times. Like, Lee's always going to stay busy with something. Take a breath. Two marriages, two divorces. In 1988, Lee is going to marry for the last time. This last marriage is to Herbert Ross, legendary dancer, choreographer, actor, and film director in Hollywood. He directs such classics that you may know as The Goodbye Girl, Steel Magnolias, Footloose, Boys on the Side, lots of films, also very, very gay. Jackie's going to host the after party of the wedding and is openly asking guests, is he gay? (laughs) That's a good sign. Lee will say about Herbert Ross that he was certainly different from anybody else I'd been involved with. And the film world sounded exciting. Well, it wasn't. I hated Hollywood and the provincialism of the industry. Huh. Herbert had been married to ballerina Nora Kay until she died, and Lee will say unbeknownst to me, he was still obsessed with her. It was Nora said this, and Nora did it like that. Nora liked brown and orange. If anybody even breathed her name, Herbert would burst into tears. I had to clench my fist every time and was deeply hurt as I thought I had created a wonderful life for him. Thank God we never really settled in Los Angeles. My New York was difficult for Herbert, so we parted. Now. No more on husbands. <laughs> I mean, Lee might have hated that uh, Herbert was gay, but he did have money. And Lee at the time is financially pretty strapped. And maybe she's missing her friend Truman. So I don't have much of an idea on this one. I can't really explain it. They will divorce shortly before his death in 2001. Done. Lee? No more marriages. After this divorce, Lee will take back the Radswell name and be done with the marrying game. Throughout this time, from 1986 to 1994, Lee will keep herself busy working as a PR executive for Giorgio Armani. She'll direct special events for the legendary Italian fashion designer. In 1994, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, Lee's sister, does pass away. And Jackie... Believing revenge is a dish best served cold, leaves no provision in her will for her sister Lee, although she will leave a provision for each of Lee's children. Jackie will write in her will to explain the no provision part for Lee, for whom she has great affection, but she's not leaving her anything because, quote, I have already done so in my lifetime, unquote. Yikes. My husband. Gore Vidal again, (laughs) with a brother like that who needs an enemy, will say that no one who understood everything that had happened between Jackie and Lee had any disagreement with Jackie's sentiment that Lee had been sufficiently provided for. It is Jackie's final cut, and revenge in this case was sweeter than any type of sisterly love. Kind of trashy. Lee, for her part, will say that being Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis' sister had been double-edged. Quote, In some funny way, I'm lucky that there was so much more interest in my sister. At times it was annoying, at times funny. Perhaps the most depressing part was that whatever I did or tried to do got disproportionate coverage purely because of Jackie being my sister. But you learn to deal with scrutiny, even the lies, as long as it's not malicious. May have been a little malicious. At times. Lee will love long and prosper, continuing to do her thing. I do love this quote. U.S. Vogue's former editor-at-large, Andre Leon Talley, said about Lee, she edits herself, she edits her wardrobe, she edits her life. Lee never really stops the process of editing from day one. She's always editing. Caroline Lee Radziwill will pass away at the age of 85 in February of 2019. After a life well and fully lived and loved, she will pass from natural causes in her New York City home, remembered as an international socialite, a fashion icon, a muse, hopefully remembered as so much more than the baby sister of Jackie Kennedy. It's a fascinating and trashy life. Lee Radziwill, well done. Like, I don't like to have trashy favorites, but as baby (laughs) sisters go, 
I root for this one. If she had thought of great gardens, she'd be remembered for that. (laughs) As trash cans go, it might be hard to estimate foreign currency exchange rates and all. I will say, for whatever trash cans Lee gets, they are all beautifully designed and decorated, dressed in diamonds and furs and lots of Yves Saint Laurent, who will become her favorite designer after she ditches Givenchy in 1962. We'll follow up on that scandalous story Along with beginning the March series this week of heiresses, I think you're coming to us, Stacey, with the spiderwebs about nothing good ever starts on a yacht. Kind of. Or yachts make nothing better. Or I don't know. You name it. Mine has its own missile guidance system on it. (laughs) (laughs) You can find us over there at patreon.com slash trashy divorces if you are in need of trash candy. At every level, we have your sweet tooth covered. And that is going to take us out for another week of Trashy Divorces. Thank you for listening and spending your time with us this week. We are so grateful for you and your trashy, trashy hearts. Mm -hmm. The trashier heart, the better the heart, I always say. Friends, we hope that you will wash your hands. Friends, we hope that you will wear those masks. Just double them up. And until we see you next week. Keep those hearts trashy. As trashy as can be. Thanks for tuning in, friends. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. Trashy Divorces is written and produced by us, Stacy and Alicia for Hemlock Creatives. You can contact us at trashydivorces at gmail.com or find us on the web at trashydivorces.com. Our art is by Sydney V. Smith. You can find her at sydneyvsmith at carbonmade.com. And our music is used with permission of Ratsy. You can find her at Ratsy's store on Instagram. Need more trash candy in your life? Our Patreon community includes some of the very best humans around, hundreds and hundreds of hours of bonus content, and fresh trash candy every week for all levels of support. You can join Team Trash Candy at patreon.com slash trashy divorces. Want trashy divorces swag? Check out our merch shop and Trash Panda Enthusiasm Society at bit.ly slash trashy gear. If you're interested in advertising with Trashy Divorces, reach out to trashy divorces at gmail.com. And last but not least, come play with us on social. We're at Trashy Divorces at Instagram, which Alicia mostly runs. Twitter, which Stacy mostly runs. And on Facebook, which we split. There's also a Trashy Divorces discussion group on Facebook where the trash magic never ends. Thanks again for listening, everybody, and spending your time with us. Until we talk again, keep keep it it trashy. trashy.